The BRICS group of developing countries might be adding more letters to its name. We will talk about the future of the bloc. Hello, I'm Arnold Knight and this is The Heat. The acronym BRICS was con coined in 2001 by a Goldman Sachs economist to list the countries that would dominate economic growth by 2050. Brazil, Russia, India and China. And a few years later, those countries formed a partnership that later included South Africa. That's the S on the term BRICS. And now more letters could be added as the group discussed multilateralism and expansion at a meeting hosted by China. Dong Xu has details from Beijing. In a virtual meeting with the major emerging economies known as collectively BRICS, Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi spoke to his counterparts from the five-member bloc, including Brazil, Russia, India and South Africa, and repeated a push for multilateralism and an end to the Cold War mentality. Wang touched on the global security initiative proposed by President Xi Jinping and called for progress among developing countries. Despite the hit by global pandemic, the international situation has presented a series of challenges. However, China looks forward to an in-depth exchange of views with BRIC partners on major issues of common interest and to build further consensus. On the COVID-19 pandemic, Wang backed China's dynamic zero-COVID policy. He reiterated that the goal is to minimize risks, protect people's lives, and mitigate the economic impact. The foreign minister's meeting will pave the way for the leaders' meeting, tentatively scheduled for the end of June. This will be the first such summit to be held amid the conflict in Ukraine. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has cast a shadow over this year's gathering, but China and the other four members of BRICS say they aim to improve coordination with each other on new geopolitical challenges, pushing for true multilateralism and working in solidarity to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and promote peaceful development. Dong Xue, CGTN, Beijing. To discuss uh, the subject further, let's bring in our panelists from Sao Paulo. Jilton Schwartz is a professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo. Anton Fedyoshin is a professor of history at American University right here in Washington, D.C. And also here in Washington, D.C., Saurabh Gupta is senior Asia-Pacific international relations policy specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And Sarah Gupta, let me start with you. you know, as we heard our reporter tell us there, that this is a meeting that took place while the war, uh, the conflict in Ukraine continues to dominate the world. It also comes at a time when the world economy is being hit. Inflation is rising in many countries. There's still supply chain problems causing bottlenecks around the world. Um, so what dominated the agenda for this BRICS meeting? Well, I think what dominated the agenda was at the meeting was trying to be a stabilizing economic influence. Uh, obviously, one of the parties of the BRICS is caught up in the conflict and is not about to enter into ceasefire negotiations. So there's not much that the other part parties could do in this regard. But the, but the ramifications of the conflict, the economic ramifications of the conflict in particular, uh, is something that the, the parties can work towards and try to ameliorate both for themselves and for the developing world and for others, not just for, for developing countries, but also not to lose sight of the goals, the long-term goals in terms of macroeconomic coordination for a healthier multilateral system, dealing with COVID-19 challenges. Those were, not, those were not forgotten and those were important topics which were on the agenda. And as, of course, as, the, as was mentioned, uh, the expansion potentially of the BRICS also which help, which will help coalesce developing countries in speaking with one voice. So, Rob, I want to read you some comments that was made by uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping. He told the gathering via a recorded message, and I'm reading this to you, I'm quoting it. It says, it is more than ever important for emerging markets and developing countries to strengthen solidarity and cooperation. The five BRICS nations need to engage in dialogue and exchanges with more emerging markets and developing countries. And a moment ago, you mentioned the fact that these ministers also talked about expansion. Why expansion now? And what's the thinking behind 
expanding the group? Expanding the group would make the group more representative. Of course, there are huge developing countries out here which have a very significant uh, uh, share of the global economy, or at least of the, glo the global economy of the South. But uh, just as the BRICS talk about making the multilateral system more representative, uh, it is their obligation to make the BRICS also more representative. It's not just about big countries, but it should also be about middle powers within the BRICS. Countries like Egypt, Argentina, uh, countries like Indonesia, and perhaps also a, a major player in Africa, which doesn't, which of course hasn't got its act fully together, but but deserves to be in this in in such a setting like Nigeria, 100 million plus people, a, a literate population, a dynamic country in some respects, and that's why the point is to make it representative. But also, you know, one of the points the BRICS get at is yeah. we don't want block-based formations. And it's important because in this day, there is this, there is the, in this context of the Ukraine challenge, there's the fear that we might want to get into very exclusive little blocks yeah. to, to counteract uh, the unilateralism perhaps of the West. And that might not be really helpful in the longer run. All right, and we're also joined now by Aina Tangen. He is a political commentator. He joins us from Beijing. Aina, of course, as I mentioned, this uh, meeting, virtual meeting it was, of foreign ministers of the BRICS countries, uh, takes place as the uh, conflict in Ukraine continues. And we know that that conflict has contributed in no small way to um, the economic hit that the world uh, is uh, facing right now. So how important and how relevant was this meeting taking place at this time? Well, it's very important, especially when you start looking at the at the sanctions, who voted for it, who did not. Uh, obviously, there's there's something akin to kind of a non-aligned movement uh, that is going on. I mean, despite pressure, you had Mexico, uh, you know, Brazil, many of the other countries saying, look, we just don't want to be part of this. This isn't our fight. Uh, but I think there's a growing kind of awareness that uh, in the past, uh, countries have been used um, kind of in, you know, as proxies in these kind of struggles and conflicts between larger powers. And I think there's a, a real desire uh, by the, uh, these countries to say no to that. So uh, while, yes, uh, I think there is some validity to the point that, you know, this isn't about blocks and things like that, I do think it, the Global South and also the stands are now waking up to the fact that they need to chart a course that is a, a little bit more independent. Julson Schwartz, you were on the show recently and you talked about a new global order which wouldn't have two blocks like we saw during the Cold War, but uh, a realignment where you would see a number of smaller blocks. Um, talk to us about that and how an organization, a grouping like BRICS would fit into that. Well, I think that uh, what we have uh, now, especially after the pandemics and with the conflict now, is a clear perception that the overall framework, the global framework that was developed after the Second World War has just collapsed. We are really in the midst of a global crisis, but it's mainly a crisis of the institutions that were built. And uh, we've just uh, heard about the non-alignment movement, things like that, that um, have come to be, in a way, not very much prized by the, the, the larger countries. I think that what can emerge now is a bottom-up process, and the BRICS uh, uh, framework is really favorable for that kind of perspective, a bottom-up perspective that's built not only on geopolitical issues as such, like frontiers and territories, but major issues should be addressed. So now we have a major public health uh, challenge, which is clearly global. We have inflation, which is spreading all over the planet. We have a food uh, problem, the supply of food. The global uh, supply chains have been, uh, in a way, hit by the crisis since the pandemic, but with the, with the conflict uh, again. So I think that uh, what we have now is uh, a situation where the, the global system as such must be rebuilt. The institutions that were built after the Second World War are not working anymore. And uh, what we need now is leadership based on themes, on subjects, on e big issues that have a clear global importance rather than a more strictly territorial approach to geopolitics. Anton Fedyashin, uh, of course, Russia, which is engaged in a conflict with Ukraine right now, is a member of BRICS. But 
Something that the other four members must have been acutely aware of was the manner in which the United States weaponized its, its strength uh, of the dollar, its, um, its control over the international financial system, um, to basically try and strangle uh, Russia. So there must be some kind of renewed urgency among BRICS nations right now on how they could lessen their dependence on the dollar, for one, uh, and also lessen their vulnerability to the kind of action that the United States took. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is a sense of urgency. And um, when we started the show, I think uh, Sirab mentioned that uh, um, Ukraine was like a uh, shadow uh, over this meeting of foreign ministers of BRICS uh, countries. Um, that is true, uh, because what's going over there, what's going on over there is uh, uh, doubtless a tragedy, but this war is also a catalyst, um, as many wars are in history, and it is uh, speeding up processes that had begun earlier, but have now taken on uh, both an urgency and I would stress even more a life of uh, their own. Um, if we had been having the show about 10 years ago, and someone were to ask seriously, well, what do you think about the de-dollarization of the global economy? We would have laughed that person out of the studio, most likely. But here we are in 2022, and the de-dollarization of the global economy is a reality, and no one's laughing uh, any longer. Um, uh, countries are having very serious second thoughts about their dependence on the American dollar. It had a very long run. Uh, it was very profitable. God knows it was the world's most stable uh, currency in the late 1940s when the Bretton Woods system came into existence. And it essentially created the very competitors that are now uh, laying claim to have the right to articulate the rules by which the global game is being played. And so things that had begun before this war, such as the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, for example, in 2016, um, all of that is now going to speed up. And 10 years from now, when we're having this conversation, we may well be talking about a world that's uh, broken up into geoeconomic confederations. Um, I don't think they will be blocks, by the way. Um, I think Jilson mentioned this earlier. I agree. It's, it won't be blocks, but it will be a very multilateral system. Uh, we're facing the geoeconomic equivalent of a Copernican revolution, of a complete realignment and reconceptualization of how the global economy works. Saurabh Gupta, you know, I mean, on the subject of de-dollarization, there was a paper that was published uh, by Cambridge University. It says that the U.S. dollar's supremacy and U.S. global leadership have been increasingly questioned since the financial crisis of 2007-2008. Uh, now, of course, we have the Ukraine crisis, and countries, as we've heard, are moving, are making efforts to, to de-dollarize global trade, to move away on, from their dependence uh, on the dollar. Do you think where do you think that's going to go? Will that momentum increase? And, I mean, the other question is, what will replace the dollar? Oh, that momentum is going to increase, and I wouldn't just limit it to the dollar. You know, there are three areas where there is going to be real attention by emerging markets and by the non-Western countries. One is, of course, the dollar. Uh, one is, second is going to be in the area of high technologies, and third is going to be in the area is is basically data. Think about it: any any transaction which happens in dollars, anything which has an embedded American high technology item, or any data packet which goes through an American server falls under American jurisdiction. And America, these were the public goods that America provided to international order, and these are the public goods which the Americans are now pulling back and privatizing within a small pro-Western grouping. And therefore, these are the areas on which, in which I, I expect that the countries are going to become much more alert. Talking specifically of, about the dollar, obviously, we have a number of secondary currencies which are now becoming much harder. Korean won, the Swiss franc, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just about the dollar and the one. Uh, dollar and the, and the euro, but of course, we have the one coming up, the renminbi. It is being internationalized. I estimate, I anticipate that just after, like, we had RMB internationalization really kick off in a big way uh, after the global financial crisis. After this Ukraine crisis, we are going to see a significant deepening uh, 
a financial deepening of China's financial markets so as to harden the Chinese currency so that someday China can borrow unlimited amounts in its currency while also having that currency hard enough and, and as a store of value for foreigners to be using for payment purposes, for invoicing purposes. So that's where I see the system going. It will take time, but I will say one thing. China is that one country, non-Western country, which can break out of all these shackles. It has broken out of the trade shackles by being the biggest trader. It can break out of the financial shackles by really internationalizing and hardening the RMB, which it, I anticipate within 10 years. And it is that one country in the global south which has the capability to also transcend the export controls in the technology area go about 10 years down the line. So. China's incentive structures, we know, play within the system, but also reform yourself faster. But that depend, but how it carries its brick com compatriots along so that there's a wider community on which it can bank on as it goes forward remains to be seen. Jilton, what is your view on creating an alternative to using the dollar as the world's reserve currency? I think that behind any currency, any currency, uh, there are three three main elements. The first one, as mentioned, is telecommunications. We cannot think uh, about currencies, about trade, any economic process without really checking what are the conditions in the telecommunications infrastructure. And we have seen over the more, more recent period, we have seen blockchain emerging, we have seen the internet evolving, but also we have seen kind of a blockade against Chinese telecommunications expansion. So I think that the first thing in order to achieve a new uh, international financial order is really to build up uh, more autonomous or at least more diverse telecom infrastructures. That's the first, the first uh, element of a new currency. The second element is really energy. It's about energy. We can see now the connections between Europe and Russia, for instance, with respect to gas, with respect to oil. So energy and uh, evolving with the international distribution of capacities to generate and consume energy is the second point that underlies any currency. And third, last but not least, is culture, soft power, services. We know that the softer dimension of economics has been playing a, a greater role, especially because of the telecom expansion. So telecom, energy, and soft power, I think, are the three frontiers for anyone who wants to build up in the next uh, 10 years a new financial landscape. And I thank you. you know, as I mentioned, when we see these discussions about replacing the uh, dollar as the reserve currency, um, one of the questions that inevitably gets asked all the time is, yes, that's a good idea, but what replaces uh, the dollar? I mean, it doesn't have to be one currency, or could, could it be a basket of currencies? Well, that's uh, one of the, the issues that, uh, you know, we should delve a little bit more deeply into. I don't think that China is looking to replace the United States in terms of being a financial hegemon. Uh, quite frankly, I think what they're doing is providing an example uh, of how other nations can uh, come up with uh, alternatives. I mean, trade is not going to be the way it used to be. Uh, the financial transactions, how speedily that can be done, uh, direct connections between uh, small, uh, medium-sized enterprises in one country are going to another other one. These are things that really weren't possible under these you know, large, uh, cumbersome, swift uh, used banking systems, lots of fees, sophistication, understanding the, the global um, laws and uh, tr trade routes, how to get everything done, uh, logistics. It's going to be a lot easier in the future. So I don't know that uh, this idea that you know China is going to replace the U.S. is, uh, is, is valid. Um, you know, a digital B is definitely going to be the forerunner. But I think you're going to see a rapid succession of uh, countries uh, developing their own. I don't think this idea that there has to be one currency uh, is true anymore. I think it's uh, very outmoded, along with Bretton Woods and things like that. Uh, this is going to be something that changes. Antion Fodiosin, if we look at some developments over the past few months, in February, just at the onset of the conflict in Ukraine, the United States announced that it would freeze Russian central bank assets which were held in the United States and impose sanctions uh, on the Russian Direct Investment Fund. That's a sovereign wealth fund. Um, earlier this week, though, Janet Yellen, who is the United States Treasury Secretary, said that the U.S. doesn't actually have the legal authority to seize Russian assets. But 
On the other hand, they say talks are underway to use these frozen assets to pay for reparations in Ukraine. What impact has this had on Russia, and why was Russia so vulnerable to this? I think the Russians made a uh, catastrophic misjudgment um, of the nature of the conflict uh, into which they stepped in late February. I think the expectation in uh, Moscow uh, was that this would be a, a, a quick, uh, a fast, a rapid affair. And um, this would not, what this was supposed to not give the West a chance to react uh, to the extent to which the West ended up reacting. This is why the Russians gambled with leaving half of their uh, reserves, about $300 billion uh, worth uh, in Western uh, banks in the United States, but also elsewhere. And that's when those assets were frozen. That explains uh, why, this, uh, why this happened. Um, the question about the ramifications of uh, these discussions, those are even more serious for the West, of course, because on the one hand, it is understandable that the United States and its allies and partners are looking to uh, not only punish, but potentially uh, weaken Russia for the long term, both militarily and economically. But of course, the unintended consequence of this is that every country, regardless of whether it plans to invade or doesn't plan to invade, every politician, every leader in the world will now ask him or herself the question of whether Western financial institutions are trustworthy. And if it's not a question of invasion uh, or annexation, maybe in 10 years it'll be a question of environmental issues. There are already articles coming out that are uh, challenged, including in foreign affairs, that are challenging nations' uh, sovereign rights over their environment, for example, what they choose or not choose to do with rainforests, rivers, um, uh, mountains, and so on and so forth. Who's to say that in 10 or 15 years, um, uh, you know, uh, countries' deposits won't be temporarily or partially frozen in exchange for their changing their uh, attitude towards their domestic environmental policies. That's just one example. It could be anything else. So, um, you know, one of the unintended consequences of this decision to freeze is that this will erode trust in the United States. And trust is ultimately the most important currency uh, in the world. And the U.S. has had it, um, but now those uh, that trust is going to start to erode. As for the use of the frozen assets for, um, uh, for reparations, that's the question that Yellen was specifically addressing, and that's where there will be serious legal hurdles, both in the U.S. and in European countries, of not just freezing, but then confiscating and using uh, Russian uh, state funds in order to start rebuilding Ukraine. Anna Tangen has, uh, and Anton just told us, I mean, trust has been eroded, but what kind of action can smaller countries take uh, to avoid uh, the kind of action that was taken against Russia? Well, we see this uh, with ASEAN uh, in their recent uh, visit to the United States. I mean, despite a, a tremendous amount of pressure to make condemnations uh, against Russia, they avoided it. There were some general uh, ideas along the lines of you know, what's important under the uh, UN, but uh, nothing specific. And this is, I think, what you're starting to see here is that clumps of uh, countries uh, especially on a regional basis, are going to come together and then perhaps even on, as we, we've been talking about in terms of the global south. And it is really this issue of trust. It's not that they're um, you know, going to get together because they plan to invade one area or another area. It's simply uh, self-protection. Uh, these are the, uh, you know, the other countries gathering themselves because they sense that the United States, and, and in terms of in terms of uh, its actions, is no longer a benign hegemon. It is actually uh, fairly aggressive uh, in its desire to remain on top. And they don't want to be cannon fodder for this. So uh, I completely agree with this statement about trust. Uh, it is lacking now, and you're, that is what is precipitating this uh, global realignment, uh, both politically, financially, uh, and economically. Jonathan, getting back to the BRICS countries uh, and looking at some numbers here, the BRICS nations account for 41% of the global population, 24% of global GDP, and 
of global trade. Um, how do these countries expand their share of GDP and of global trade as well? Well, I think that the main thing here, uh, which is still uh, transitional, I mean, there's not a consensus about this, is the role of the state. Uh, some of the BRICS countries have uh, important strategic policies, development policies in place. But for instance, Brazil, Brazil lacks uh, long-term development policy, and uh, we were still lagging behind even the basic, the basic tenets of organizing long-term uh, projects in Brazil. There's been a rush to privatization, but even that has been more of a rhetoric uh, that's not uh, effectively coming to practice. But I think that the main issue here is uh, reaching for a new framework for long-term development policies where the state plays uh, uh, another role. When we talk about the U.S. Uh, influence or the role of the U.S. as a hegemon, we know that the, probably the main, the main tool for the U.S. Uh, presence uh, globally has been uh, to support privatization processes. So as long as the national states lose power or lose their ability to establish long-term goals, that weakens the system, weakens the local currency. So in Brazil, it's very clear. Dollarization became a, even something complementary to privatization policies. So I think that uh, the one way to go to expand our weight in global trade and, and even to expand GDP is to resume a long-term view where the state plays a strategic role and where, of course, given that you defend uh, a minimum of resistance uh, in terms of public policies, then you can have a currency, then you can have social policies, then you can have uh, reforms that enhance the country's productivity. Because without education, there's no productivity. Now, look, in Brazil now, they're talking not only about privatization of educational systems, they're talking about just, you know, let families take care of children's education. So how come a country this big will face the challenge of higher productivity, higher GDP growth, higher global trade without education, without strong public policies in the area of education, and so on for environmental issues right. and, and, and local development. So my point is that BRICS represents an important source of inspiration for those who still believe that the economic yeah. development relies on, a, no, I wouldn't say a strong state, but an intelligent state. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. We have run out of time. Thank you to all of you for being with us. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.